Hey, how are we doing today? Hopefully everybody's doing well. So today what we're going to be doing is going over covalent bonding. So for that lesson, you do need to make sure you've got your notes, you've got something to write with, and then you probably are going to need a periodic table, so make sure you grab one of those as well. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and dive on into it. So what is a covalent bond? Well, a covalent bond is going to be a bond where we actually share our electrons. So what does that mean? What does it mean to share electrons? Okay, so when we talked about an ionic bond, we talked about how the electrons from one atom would move closer to another atom. And so this other atom would have a stronger attachment to that electron. Now, because of that, because this now has more electrons on it, this becomes negative, this becomes positive, all right? A covalent bond, instead of pulling an electron closer to one side over the other, those electrons are kind of sitting directly in the middle. So they're sharing them. Now, sometimes with covalent bonds, we'll have an electron that moves a little bit closer to the other side. And if that happens, we call it a polar covalent bond. But if we're talking about covalent bonds, we're talking about those bonds actually sharing their electrons. All right. So... Typically, if I'm talking about something like hydrogen bonding with another hydrogen, what do we think? Where, where are those electrons going to be? Well, if they're equally attracted to each other because they've got the same amount of protons, right, their electrons are going to sit directly in between those two nuclei, right? So that would be an equal sharing, and that would be a nonpolar covalent bond. Whereas if we have something like a hydrogen bonded to a carbon, that electron is going to move a little bit closer to the carbon side. And since it's closer to carbon, now the carbon's going to be a little negative. The hydrogen is going to be a little positive. And so that would be a polar covalent bond. Now, one thing to note is that chemical bonds, like the word itself, is actually invented. Because a bond would represent there's something physically attaching those two things. Well, there's not a bond is actually just energy that is between them. And so when we talk about a bond, that's basically representing that energy that's holding those two atoms together. Okay. So let's keep that in mind. Make sure you recognize that, that a bond is not actually a physical thing that's attaching those two things together. Because typically when you think of a bond, you're like, okay, well, I've got a string and I tie it between one finger and another finger. Well, that would be these fingers are bonded together not they're just naturally attracted to each other, right? So in a bond, when we talk about bonds in chemistry, we need to recognize that that bond is just us trying to visualize what it looks like, how these things actually attach together, okay? Really, it's just energy. So when we're talking about a covalent bond, we've got three types of bonds that actually form. We've got a single bond, a double bond, and a triple bond. Now, again, that's basically just telling me how many electrons are actually being shared. So if a single bond, if we're talking about a single bond, we've got one pair of electrons, so there's two electrons actually there. A double bond has two pairs, so there's four electrons. And then a triple bond has three pairs, so there would be six electrons, okay? So what actually happens? I like to think of these as kind of like rubber bands, right? Because if I've got one rubber band, and I put those rubber bands in between, that rubber band in between my fingers, it's going to be fairly easy to hold those two fingers apart. Now, let's say I add a second rubber band. What am I going to notice happens with my fingers? Well, one, there's going to be more energy pulling on those fingers, right? So probably they're going to get a little bit closer together, okay? There's also going to be a lot more energy that's stored in that bond, right? That thing that's connecting my two fingers together. Now, what would happen if I added a triple or a third rubber band to this. Well, same thing that happened with the second, we'd get a little bit closer and the amount of energy holding those fingers together is gonna actually be increasing, all right? So thinking about this with our bond length, which is again, remember the distance um, between those two nuclei, right? So that bond length is actually going to be decreasing as I increase how many bonds I have. And that distance, is going to be at its minimum, right? We're not going to be really far apart. There's going to be the attraction there because as they move further apart, um, it's going to get harder and harder and harder for those electrons to be held onto anymore, all right? Um, so here are our general trends with bond energy. 
So with bond energy, you need to recognize that again, if I've got a triple bond, it's going to be shorter. And if I've got a single bond, it's going to be the longest. And you can only compare bonds in terms of their length based off of like bonds, so like atoms. So if I'm comparing a carbon bond, I'm going to have to compare a carbon to carbon bond with a carbon to carbon bond, right? So a triple carbon to carbon bond versus a single carbon to carbon bond. And when we're looking at these, we'll recognize that for like a carbon to carbon here, we've got 120 picometers. And that's the triple bond versus the single bond, which is 154. So if you look at those differences, the triple bond has a shorter distance between its nuclei than the single bond does. Again, kind of the same thing. Whereas if I have a carbon to nitrogen bond, we'll see that it's actually 116 versus the single, which is 147. So when we're looking at these, we do need to make sure that we're only comparing bonds of the same type, all right? Okay, so bond energy. Now again, bond energy, remember, is the energy that's required to actually break the bond, break that chemical bond. And we measure this energy based off of their attraction. So we talk about Coulomb's law and Coulombic attraction. So that's what we're talking about trying to break, that attraction between those bonds. Now, we can use bond energy to calculate the heats that are actually in a reaction. So is it gaining heat or is it losing heat, which is energy, right? So if I'm forming bonds, I'm going to be, remember forming bonds means we're going to be exothermic. And if I'm breaking, sorry, yeah, exothermic. And then if I'm breaking bonds, it is going to be endothermic, right? I have to absorb energy to cause that bond to break, right? Um, now, it does say right here that your average energies that we have for bonds is going to be found in your book. Um, I will be assigning a book for y'all that is online um, just as an additional resource for y'all to use. Now, right here, I talk about my change in heat. Now, the change in heat is going to be the sum of my bonds broken minus the sum of my bonds that are formed. All right, so I've got my bonds broken minus bonds formed, and that should be my total change in energy. Okay, so here's an example. I've got hydrogen plus oxygen, and it's producing two waters. So how do I actually do this? How do I solve for the bond energy, this change in heat? Well, I'm going to look at first my hydrogen bond here. I know that the bond energy for hydrogen is 436. But if you look at this, I do actually have two hydrogen bonds that are forming there. So I'm going to have to take that number and actually multiply it. So that's what we see right here. So I have 2 times 436, and that represents my two hydrogen bonds there. Next, I have my oxygen. So I look back over here at my table, and I recognize that oxygen to oxygen has a bond energy of 498. I've only got one of that oxygen bond, so I'll take that oxygen bond and I will add it to my hydrogen bond over here on the left. So I have two times my 436, which is gonna be my hydrogen bond, plus the 498, which is my oxygen bond. All right, now that would be what is on my reactant side, right? So those would be my bonds that are actually going to be broken, right? The bond between those two hydrogens and the bond between those two oxygens. And then I'm actually going to be forming a bond between all of that to make H2O. Now, my hydrogen to oxygen bond energy is 464. So looking back up here, if I have H2O, for each water, I'm going to have one, two, one, two hydrogen to oxygen bonds. Okay, but I do have two water there. So I need to recognize that I have four hydrogen to oxygen bonds. I'll multiply that by my 464 because that's the bond energy. And then I'll take all of that and subtract, okay? I've got my bonds broken minus my bonds formed. And what we'll find is that our energy is negative 486 kilojoules. And so I know that that is exothermic because my energy is negative there, which means energy is being released, which means that reaction is actually going to feel a little bit warm. All right, so now let's actually look at how we actually use all of this.
again, we talk about electronegativity a lot. We talk about how it's our, how our bonds are actually forming using this electronegativity and how those bonds can actually occur because I've got this change in energy that's going, right? It's a tendency to attract an electron, right? And the more likely an atom is to attract an electron, the more likely it is to form a bond with something else. So when we're looking at this, again, we're talking about the attraction of those electrons. And we know our general trend is that as I move across towards fluorine, it's going to increase. And as I move down away from fluorine, it's going to decrease, right? And it does range from four, which is C or fluorine, down all the way to the very bottom, which is 0.7 at cesium, okay? Now, again, if we're looking at our general trend on the periodic table, I know that my fluorine is going to be four. So as I move down, my general trend is that it's going to decrease by one, okay? And as I move left from fluorine, it's gonna decrease by 0 0.5. So that's a general trend. If they don't give you an actual number for your electronegativities, you can use that to solve for it, okay? So, how did they actually come up with these numbers? Well, they came up with these electronegativities by comparing the measured bond energy and the expected bond energy. Okay, so they compared the measured bond energy versus the expected bond energy. So how does that work? Well, first off, they did a prediction, right? They predicted how much the energy it would take to remove or break that bond or um, the energy that's inside of that bond, right? And then they compared it to what they actually measured. So how much energy it actually took for that to occur, okay? So my expected bond energy, so the bond energy from, for instance, H2X, hydrogen bonded to mystery element X, what I would do is I would take my hydrogen to hydrogen bond plus mystery element X to X bond, and I would add, or I would divide those two numbers by two, right? So I'd get an average. And that would tell me what I expected it to be. Then I would compare it to what it actually was based off of my energy. And then how did I use that? Well, I used that to figure out my electronegativity difference. So the actual hydrogen uh, uh, element X bond minus the expected, which is again coming from getting that average, and if I found that the electronegativity was greater for X than H, that means those electrons are gonna be closer to X. And so if those electrons are closer to X, then that molecule is polar. If the electronegativities are not close, are the, if the electronegativities are not going to be greater, so for instance, H has a greater electronegativity, then the electronegativities are going to be pretty much the same, which means they would be a nonpolar bond. All right, now, what makes a bond polar or nonpolar? Again, we're talking about those electrons moving from one side to the other. So the electrons are not actually shared equally directly in between the two atoms. They're going to be closer to one side over the other. All right, so they are closer to one side over the other. And what we'll end up seeing is that there actually is a partial charge that forms, right? So they're not all the way over like with an ionic bond, but they are closer to that side, which makes that side a little bit negative, which makes this side a little bit positive because it has less negative, less electrons on it. All right, so I'm comparing a hydrogen to a carbon. Hydrogen has an electronegativity of about 2 to 2.1. It's 2.1, really. Carbon has an electronegativity of about 2.5. So I'm like, okay, how do I know about this bond? Well, if you remember last class, we talked about our electronegativity differences. If I have 0 to 0 0.4, I would say this is nonpolar. If I have 0 0.4 to 1.69, we would call this a polar covalent bond. And then if I have 1.7 plus on, we would call that ionic. And this actually should be 0 
Apparently, y'all can see I'm struggling a little bit. 0 0.39. There we go. Okay, so I know that I've got my nonpolar, my polar, and my ionic bonds that form. So I can look at this and I see hydrogen has a 2.0 slash 2.1. Carbon has about a 2.5. I compare those two and I get 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 which tells me that it's going to be falling in that polar area. So that would be a polar covalent bond. What does that tell me? It tells me that it has a dipole moment. So it tells me that that is going to have a slightly positive side and a slightly negative side as well. If I've got a hydrogen to hydrogen bond, I can look at those and see, okay, well, hydrogen is 2.1. The other hydrogen is also 2.1. So the difference in electronegativity is zero. Since their difference is zero, that tells me that that is a nonpolar bond. Okay? All right. So now we know how those bonds form. We know how to determine if it's polar or nonpolar. So let's just talk real briefly about some of the properties and remind y'all how to name and write your formulas for covalent bonds. All right. So properties of molecular compounds. Molecular compound is another way of saying a covalent compound. So first off, we need to recognize that compounds of nonmetals are made of individual molecule units. So what do I mean by that? Well, it means that we've got these chains of individuals that are all kind of floating around, right? So sugar, a sugar molecule does not attach to another sugar molecule. If it did, then we would have a longer chain, which would make us, make us have a bigger covalent compound. All right, and so when we're looking at these, we need to recognize that with those things, with those molecular compounds, we're not actually going to be forming this continuous chain, All right? All right, so solubility in water does depend on their polarity. Again, polarity, we are looking for that dipole. We're looking for that difference of electronegativity between 0 0.4 and 1.69, all right? The reason that it does dissolve or does not dissolve in water is water is polar. And so a lot of times what we talk about is like dissolves like. So if I've got a polar substance, it will dissolve other polar substances. If I've got a nonpolar substance, it will dissolve other nonpolar substances. All right? It's the reason why we have to use different solvents to actually dissolve things like glue. You need to have a nonpolar substance to dissolve nonpolar substances. You need to have a polar substance to dissolve other polar substances, okay? Now, they do tend to have low melting points and boiling points. Wax is an example of a covalent compound. We know that it's very easy to melt, melt wax. Uh, melt wax. And so since I know that it's very easy to welt, wow, melt wax. Apparently that's hard for me to say today. Since I know it is easy, I know that this probably does fall into the covalent compound section. Um, we know other covalent compounds, for instance, CO2, it's already reached its boiling point, right? It's a gas already at, at room temperature. Okay. Now we do typically have a melting point that's generally less than 300 degrees Celsius. Remember, if you think back, ionic compounds if you remember, they are all generally greater than 300 degrees Celsius. Now, the covalent bonds are strong because the attraction between those molecules are generally weak. So typically what we see is that we have a strong covalent bond because their general attraction is actually a little bit weaker. Ionic kind of does the opposite of that, right? We have a strong ionic bond because their attractions are very high. And that has to do with those electrons being pulled really close to one side over the other. All right. Covalent compounds, their attraction actually happens. Those bonds actually form because there's no attraction or very little attraction between molecules outside of them, all right? Um, and then we do typically find covalent compounds or molecular compounds in all three states of matter. So we've got something like carbon dioxide. That's going to be a gas at room temperature. We've got something like... Hmm, gasoline that tends to be a liquid at room temperature. And then we've got things like wax that tends to be a solid at room temperature. So we do tend to see them all at 
um, or we do tend to see all states of matter with our covalent compounds. Whereas with ionic, if you remember most of the time, pretty much all the time with some exceptions, they are going to be solids. Okay. All right. So those are your properties. Now let's actually take a look at naming, make sure you recognize how to name, and then we will be done with the notes for today. So for naming a covalent compound, the biggest thing that you need to keep in mind is that you are going to need prefixes. Remember, you don't use prefixes with ionic compounds. You're just going to name your metal, then name your nonmetal, and change the nonmetals ending to ide. With a covalent compound, you use a prefix. Now, that prefix is mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, and deca, and that represents 1 through 10. All right. Now, here's something I will say. We don't tend to use mono anymore. Mono is kind of a thing of a past because... Why would we use mono if I wrote the compound there? If I wrote the element there, then I'm going to assume that it is there. If I put mono there, that's kind of being redundant, saying I've got one carbon. Well, if I just put C, then that tells me I've got one carbon, right? I don't need to add mono to the beginning of it. Or if when I'm naming it, I say I've got carbon, I don't need to say mono because, again, if I put carbon there, there has to be at least one, right? Okay. So I know my prefixes, so how do I actually name them? Well, we name them first with our non-metal. Now, the non-metal that goes first is going to be the least electronegative. And basically, the simplest way to look at this is see which is furthest from fluorine. Um, that's the easiest way that I have found that helps me remember where to determine which element goes first. Okay, so my prefix, I would have my non-metal first. And I would add a prefix if I have more than one. So if I have, um, let's say, NO2, then I would say I have nitrogen. And I don't use mono because I, again, recognize that if I wrote the name, then there has to be at least one. And then my pre, uh, for my second element, I would have my second nonmetal but I would change its ending to ide. So right here, I've got oxygen. I need to put my prefix for how many? So di. And then I put oxide there. So it would be my metal, or my non-metal, sorry. And then I would change its ending to ide. So that would be how we write our name, how we write our formula with a covalent compound. All right, y'all, that is it for the notes today. If y'all have got any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, otherwise, y'all have a great rest of the day. Bye, y'all.